Okay, hello people. Today we are going to talk about the personal fat threshold. All right, what the heck is the personal fat threshold? Well, first of all, I did not invent this term. This comes straight out of the medical literature and it basically refers to how fat you're capable of getting. All right, let's back up a little bit. Humans ingest energy from our diet, mostly in the form of carbs and fats, and then we store energy as triglycerides in specialized cells called adipocytes and essentially we're battery powered. We're basically carrying around this fat that we can use to run our whole metabolism whenever we don't have access to food. Now when you eat fat, statistically speaking, most of the fat you eat goes directly into your fat cells and is stored there. You might use some of it, burn a little bit of it on the way from your diet to your fat cells, but basically most ingested fat is stored in your fat cells. When you eat carbohydrate, what you're doing is you're smoothly downshifting the burning of fat and upregulating the burning of carbs, so you're basically sparing fat isocalorically. And when you eat carbohydrate, you're simply burning carbs isocalorically instead of fat during the period of time that the carbohydrates are available. So eating fat contributes to your fat mass by being stored in your fat cells, and eating carbohydrate preserves your fat mass isocalorically by burning glucose instead of fat. So either way, when you eat fat or carbs, you're contributing to your fat mass and you're storing extra fat in your fat cells or sparing the fat that's already there in the case of carbohydrate. Now your fat cells can expand in size. They could maybe be 20 microns in diameter at the smallest and then 200 microns in diameter at the biggest. And since the volume of a sphere is uh, the cube of the radius, you can basically expand a fat cell by maybe 4,000 times the volume. So as your fat cells are getting bigger and approaching their maximum size that they're capable of getting, you signal to your body that you need more fat cells and you undergo adipocyte hyperplasia. That's where you sprout new baby fat cells if you can and have more fat cells. Now, some people are good at sprouting new baby little fat cells to hold more fat. And this is a genetic factor. So some people genetically can just get fatter and fatter and fatter and have way more fat cells. Other people are genetically limited as to how many fat cells they have. So once their fat cell approaches its maximum size, they cannot make new fat cells. They just start running out of places to put fat. So your fat is initially stored in your subcutaneous adipocytes where it's very harmless uh, and it's designed to be stored there. As you approach the maximum diameter of these fat cells, you signal the growth of new fat cells if you can genetically. But at a certain point, you're limited by your genetics and your ability to make new fat cells. And when this happens, if you've made all the new fat cells you can and your fat cells are all approaching maximum size, now you have to start storing fat ectopically. That's the visceral abdominal fat that people store. And unfortunately, this is a sign that you're starting to get insulin resistant because you're running out of good places to easily store fat. And a number of things happen at this point. The fat circulates in your bloodstream longer because it doesn't really have a good place to go. And then your insulin is chronically elevated because insulin is trying to clear the bloodstream of fuels and trying to shove this either glucose or fat somewhere where it's out of the way, but you don't really have any place to put it. Uh, eventually, when you fill all your subcutaneous cells and you fill all your visceral cells, then fat starts getting stored ectopically, which means where it really doesn't belong. And so the very last thing you do with fat is shove it inside your liver and get fatty liver and shove it inside your pancreas and have fatty organs and that kind of thing. By the time that happens, you're you've reached your personal fat threshold, which is as fat as you can get. In other words, you've sprouted as many new baby fat cells as possible, and you filled all your fat cells up, and now you don't have a good place to put fat. And so your triglycerides are always high because that's fat energy in the bloodstream with no place to go. And now maybe your glucose is too high because all your cells are refusing any form of energy. So the glucose just circulates around. And so, Hitting your personal fat threshold is when you spill over into type 2 diabetes, which is basically an uncontrolled amount of fuels in your bloodstream and you have no place to put them because your fat cells are all full. 
usually your muscle cells are also full of glycogen at this point and you're not doing a ton of exercise to deplete them. So basically you ran out of storage either in your fat cells or in your muscle cells and typically they both have to be full for you to have type 2 diabetes. Okay, so one of the persons who really coined the term personal fat threshold is Professor Roy Taylor in the UK, and he did some really cool experiments with MRIs. And what Professor Taylor did is do cross-sectional imaging MRIs of people's liver and pancreas and visceral fat, and then he put them on super low-fat diets, very low-fat, very low-calorie diets, and watched as the liver and pancreatic fat just cleared out within a few weeks. And it became quite obvious from his studies that visceral fat was the very last thing to happen, and then the very first thing to reverse on these low calorie, low fat diets. In other words, you fill up your subcutaneous cells first, then you fill up your visceral cells, then you store fat ectopically in your liver and your pancreas, and then as soon as you go on either a very low carb diet, a low fat diet, a low calorie diet, or all three, you lose the liver and pancreatic fat first, sometimes in just a matter of days or weeks, and then you slowly lose the visceral fat and then you lose the subcutaneous fat and it's basically in reverse order that it came on. So in Professor Taylor's studies, it's important to note that he used very, very low fat diets to accomplish this sort of ectopic fat reversal and it really doesn't seem to matter whether you use a low carb diet or a low fat diet to accomplish this. At least it doesn't matter objectively. Now subjectively there might be differences in terms of how hungry people are or how they feel and blood sugar and energy levels and other subjective things that are difficult to measure might be different and I'm sure you could hear arguments from both the low carb and the low fat communities as to which one's better. But the bottom line is you can accomplish this with either low carb, low fat, or my favorite is both together, which is basically what the PE diet is. It's keeping protein and minerals and nutrients as high as possible, and then keeping both carbs and fats lower. And personally, I think that sort of thing is the fastest way to reverse ectopic fat and type two diabetes. It's essentially a protein sparing modified fast where you're eating tons of protein, but you're restricting carbs and fats a lot, maybe even as much as possible. Okay, so personal fat threshold is highly genetic and we see whole groups of people with really, really low personal fat thresholds. Southeast Asia, for example, if you're from India, you might have an exceptionally low personal fat threshold where you cannot sprout very many new fat cells and you're highly limited into the number of subcutaneous fat cells you have. So I see people from Southeast Asia who maybe only get 10 pounds overweight, but it's all right in the abdominal area and they're boom, immediately diabetic. We, we see these people in Southeast Asia who are literally 10 pounds over fat and they're instantly diabetic because they've literally filled up all their fat cells. And we, we've known this was happening for 50 years because for 50 years, we've had research showing that the diameter of your fat cells is directly linearly related to your fasting insulin and your triglycerides and your blood sugar and all of these factors that we have in metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia and type two diabetes. So the larger your fat cells, the more insulin resistant you are. And it's because you're uh, approaching that personal fat threshold where you have maximal fat storage going on. Now, other groups of people, like anyone you see on My 600 Pound Life, who's gotten really, really, really fat, they clearly have the genetic ability for adipocyte hyperplasia, where they've generated more adipocytes and they are capable of getting a lot fatter. Uh, some of these people ha have not even contracted type two diabetes yet, and maybe their insulin levels aren't super high because they still have room to expand. They could still get even fatter yet. So you can't really necessarily look at someone and tell the whole story as, as to how insulin resistant they are or hyperinsulinemic they are because you really don't know where their personal fat threshold is. Okay, so how do you know if you're approaching your personal fat threshold? Well, my favorite measurement is waist to height ratio. You measure your waist at the belly button with your abdomen fully relaxed and you divide that by your height, 
waist to height ratio. Now, waist to height ratio ideally should be less than 0.5. In other words, your waist should be less than half your height. So for example, I'm 5 foot 10, I'm 70 inches tall. My waist circumference at the belly button should be less than 35 inches, which is half my height. If your waist circumference is higher than that, there's a really good chance you've got more visceral fat than you should and that you're over fat and you're exceeding your personal fat threshold. You can also check fasting lipids, your triglyceride to HDL ratio is uh, very, very linearly associated with adipocyte size and how over fat you are. Fasting insulin is good. Uh, blood sugar is not very reliable because once your blood sugar is too high, you know you're really, really, really over your personal fat threshold. And you want to... Now one of the best examples we have of the personal fat threshold is persons who have lipodystrophy, which is a genetic condition where you have very, very little subcutaneous fat. And you might look pretty lean in terms of subcutaneous fat, but all your fat is being stored in the visceral area. And these people are, uh, they have incredibly high rates of hyperinsulinemia and metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes, even at very low body weights and relatively low amounts of body fat because they just don't have any place to put that fat. We have animal models with lipodystrophy as well, and it's fascinating. They're almost instantly diabetic. And interestingly enough, if you transplant some subcutaneous fat in these mice with lipodystrophy, you cure their insulin resistance overnight because now they have some place to store fat. It's really quite fascinating. Okay, so bottom line is you don't want to be anywhere close to your personal fat threshold. You want to stay well below that. Uh, how you look in the mirror is a pretty good indicator, but then you also might want to look at a waist to height ratio, which is even better, and some basic labs like a fasting triglyceride level, triglyceride to HDL ratio, and if you're really getting fancy, you could check a fasting insulin level as well. Okay, let's say you are over your personal fat threshold, as evidenced by any of these things. What are you going to do about it? Well, you really want to go on a low energy diet. That's where you try to shave down your grams of carbs every day. You shave down your grams of fat every day. Your protein percent is higher. It basically ends up looking like the PE diet. And I think that's probably the most effective way to go. Exercise is also good. To burn more energy speeds things up. Anytime you increase your satiety per calorie, it's beneficial and that's eating more protein, eating more fiber, uh, trying to be low carb and low fat at the same time, doing more exercise, building muscle and improving your metabolic rate. These sorts of things are all helpful. Okay, I think I talked about that long enough. If you want more information about how to reduce body fat and how to make sure that you stay well below your personal fat threshold and stay very insulin sensitive, check out the book I wrote with William Shufeld, The PE Diet. It's available at thepediet.com. And uh, I think that would be a really good strategy for anyone who's trying to stay below their personal fat threshold. All right, peace out and I will see you guys in the next one.